Good morning to each of you. Will you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 9? Isaiah chapter 9. It's certainly great to see each of you here this morning. We have several visitors with us and we are very excited that you have joined us. And And if you're looking for a church home or if you want to know more about the Hickory Knoll Church of Christ, please ask and, and please let us know. And, and we want to assist you at, at, in your development of faith as you're learning more about God's Word or as you're wanting and desiring to worship and, and to serve the Lord with a local church family. Our lesson this morning is entitled, A Government That Will Never Shut Down. Well, one thing's for sure, we don't really know what's going to happen in Washington, but Tropical Storm Karen seems to have shut down, and I know everyone is excited about that. You may recall last year I shared with you that during Hurricane Isaac we had evacuated and we came back home to find our trampoline on our neighbor's roof. And I, and I said last year we'll never, make, we'll never have that happen again because we're going to lock this thing down. And, and so on Friday afternoon, my father-in-law, you know I couldn't do this by myself, but he came over and, and helped me and, and we got the trampoline all locked down. And I was starting to feel stressed Friday about this tropical storm. And, and then yesterday I looked outside and it was sunshine and no wind. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I started getting stressed a little bit because the storm didn't come. And, and so uh, I didn't know quite what to do yesterday. And, and so finally we got out and, and the day ended up uh, turning out real nice. Earlier this week I, I came across an article written in a Brotherhood publication, Focus Press, an article by a fellow by the name of Brad Harab, and it starts off like this. As one would expect, the government shutdown is on everyone's mind and on most people's social media pages. Everyone wants to know all what it means and, and what the effect is going to be. What changes will we notice? What regularly occurring functions will we miss? But in the article, Harrop said, let's take that same question and apply it to the church. Imagine a situation in which the church has to shut down for a period of time. Surely this analogy isn't perfect, but it is an analogy. In the same way, we would have to ask those questions that naturally arise in such a situation. What would look different? Would anyone notice? Would anyone notice any changes in our evangelism? Would anyone notice any changes in the way that we encourage one another? Would anyone notice any changes when it comes to our service to others? Would anyone notice any changes when it comes to our patience and kindness? Yes, Harab writes, the goal is to make the church as pure as it can be, as the bride of Christ. And no, the church is not going to undergo a shutdown like the government. However, we would do well to remember that the things we do every single day are what determines the level of outreach in the church. Don't let your spirituality, Harab concludes, ever shut down. This morning, though, I would like to consider together with you a first promise from the book of Isaiah and a second promise in the book of Revelation in regards to a government that will never shut down. I'm in Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse number 1. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and after more heavily oppressed her, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, and Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. 
You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil, for you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. And notice Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name we will, will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. In this passage, we learn about the promise that that Jesus Christ will be born. And in verse number 6, we learn about this son named Jesus, this child, this son. We learn that his name is going to be Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We sometimes sing the song, Wonderful, Wonderful Jesus is to me. Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God is He. Saving me, keeping me from my sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer. Praise His name. But notice in verse number 6, in addition to Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace... The other description that is given about this child, this son, who was to be born. In verse number 6, it describes Jesus as everlasting. Also in verse number 6, uh, as for, or rather verse number 7, th- that there will be no end. And towards the end of verse 7, from that time forward, even for ever. In the government that will never shut down, Jesus is the King, and He is reigning supreme. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, the master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. And we know, as far as the fulfillment of this promise, we know that that Jesus was born of a virgin in the first century. Uh, We we know that his earthly parents, Joseph and Mary, had had never been with each other in that regard. And, And the Lord God enabled Mary to give birth to a son. And they named him Jesus. His name was Emmanuel, God with us. And we know that at age 12, when, when Jesus was, was on his way with his parents and as they were uh, doing some things with worship, we know that Jesus was focused on carrying out his father's business. And at age 30, we know that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan. And, and you probably remember that on the third time, The devil tempted Jesus by taking him up on top of an exceedingly high mountain. And and Satan showed Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world and their might and their power. But we know that Jesus overcame that temptation of any earthly kingdom in that regard and, and said that it is more important to worship the Lord and, and to serve Him as our God. Jesus is the King of kings, 
But it's not over an earthly kingdom, but rather it is a spiritual kingdom. Prior to the death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus was teaching about his kingdom. And he made a remarkable connection to the church. You may recall over in Matthew 16, verses 16 through 20 as a whole, but particularly verses 18 and 19, what Jesus said to Peter in reference to this kingdom, in reference to the church. Jesus says, And also I say to you that you are Peter... And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus goes on to say, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth, it will be loosed in heaven. And we also know prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, uh, of the conversation that Jesus was having with Pilate as recorded in John chapter 18, verses 33 through 7. Jesus was on on trial in a sense, and and we know how things turned out, but, but Pilate entered the praetorium and he called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking about yourself, uh, for yourself about this, or did others tell you concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And in John chapter 18, verse number 36, Jesus replied, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But but now my kingdom is not from here. Jesus goes on to say that as far as talking about his role, it's not about an earthly kingdom, but a spiritual kingdom. Kingdom, And we know that after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, beginning on the day of Pentecost, Peter took hold of that promise that was originally given to him. And he preached to the, the Jews on the day of Pentecost, as recorded in Acts 2. And also preached to the house of Cornelius and the Gentiles, as recorded in Acts 10. Thus effectively welcoming the Jews and the Gentiles into the church, into the kingdom of God. And so, yes, that original promise was made back in Isaiah about a child being born. His name would be Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty, and Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. And upon this government, his, the, upon his shoulder, this government would never come to an end. And we see throughout the New Testament that, that the kingdom that was promised was the church. And Jesus building his church and establishing it and enabling it to continue as far as all of the Jews and all of the Gentiles being welcomed and inviting. There's no discrimination. It's all about anyone who desires to give their life to God. And, and so we say all of that to come to Revelation chapter 1. Will you turn your Bibles there with me as we, we focus in on this text and, and try to seek application and, and to drive the message home this morning. Revelation chapter 1, we'll begin in verse 1 and, and read through verse number 8. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to the servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ and to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads... And those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you 
and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Maybe an overall theme of the Bible is that Jesus is coming. Jesus came and Jesus is coming again. He who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne, notice verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over all of the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him And they also who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, am I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. Who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty Jesus is our faithful witness. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is the ruler over all the kings of the earth. He has loved us and he has washed us with his blood. But notice again that promise, this second promise in verse number 7 of Revelation 1. Jesus is coming back, and this time everyone will notice. No one is going to get around the second coming of Christ. And I suppose for those who are not Christians, those who are not living faithfully, that, that's a very, rather startling promise, one that does not provide much comfort at all. But for those of us who are living faithfully to our King, our ruler of all of kings over the earth, for those of us who are living faithfully to this firstborn from the dead, to this faithful witness, the second coming of Jesus Christ is a promise that we anticipate, we long for, we want it to happen as soon as possible because we as Christians cannot wait for the day to be with our God in eternity forever. In just a little while, as we close out our worship service, we're going to sing a song, song number 727, entitled, We Shall See the King Someday. Well, you notice the words of that song. We won't sing them now. We'll sing them in a little bit. But just to prepare and anticipate singing this song and how awesome the return of Christ will be. Verse number one, though the way we journey may be often drear, we shall see the king someday. On that blessed morning, clouds will disappear. We shall see the king someday. After pain and anguish, after toil and care, we shall see the king someday. Through the endless ages, joy and blessing share, we shall see the King someday. After foes are conquered, after battles won, we shall see the King someday. After strife is over, after set of sun, we shall see the King someday. There with all the loved ones who have gone before us, we shall see the King someday. Sorrow passed forever on that peaceful shore, we shall see the King someday. We will shout and sing someday, gathered around the throne, when he shall call his own, we shall see the King someday. And so I leave you with the words in Revelation 1, chapter 1, verse number 3, that we noticed a moment ago. 
And that is what we need to do as far as the challenge to each of us. We know that Jesus is King. He is Lord, reigning supreme over this government that is on His shoulders and will never shut down. What are we to do? How are we to respond? Well, we are to read the words of the book, not only in Revelation, but all of inspired Scripture. We need to hear the word of the Lord as it's being proclaimed. And we need to make sure that we are faithfully being obedient. We are keeping the words of the Lord until the return of Christ. Because as the end of verse number 3 says, that time is near. We don't know exactly when it will be, but we do know that we're one day closer today than we were yesterday. And so all of us need to to read and to keep these words of God, particularly the plan of salvation, which teaches that we are to believe in Jesus Christ. We are to repent of our sins. The Bible talks about confessing our faith and also being baptized into Christ, immersed into water for the forgiveness of our sins. The Bible also talks about that we need to remain faithful until death. And we can do so by living a life for Christ, knowing that we're not perfect, but knowing the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us from sins as we live faithful to Him. Regardless of what ends up happening in Washington, regardless of what ends up happening in this country, Regardless of what ends up happening in our own lives, we as Christians are part of a government that will never shut down. A kingdom that is resting on the shoulders of Jesus Christ and a kingdom that we can experience now in the church and a kingdom that we can experience forever in heaven. Are you a part of the Lord's kingdom this morning? If not, will you come now while together we stand and sing?